um, and kick our discussion off. It's um, Laura is a PhD student and uh, she has a, a pretty interesting background. Uh, before we dive into the research project that you're doing, Laura, give us a little glimpse of your background because I think that's pretty interesting. Oh yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so I am actually a PhD student at a university in Israel at Bar Ilan University, um, just outside of Tel Aviv. Um, but I came home because of the pandemic and I'm in the final stretch of my um, project. So I'm just gonna actually finish it here. I've been able to do everything remotely um, over here in the States. And um, so I've been collecting data um, with the University of Maryland, Baltimore County at the Erickson School of Aging Studies. Um, so that's what I'm currently doing. Yeah. and. I love this project. And the reason that I, I have Laura on is that I think that you and the audience can definitely help her out with this project. So um, you can probably describe this project uh, more clearly and articulate than I can. So uh, share, share with the audience what you're, what you're working on. Sure, yeah. So this is my, um, my final project of the three projects that I have to do to complete my PhD. And um, my all of my research is centered on um, long-term care and um, specifically ageism in long-term care. Um, but this final, this final project is on the portrayal of, um, of long-term care in the news media, which of course, over the last year, we saw a huge increase in reporting on especially residential care facilities um, and it was, it was not great PR for the most part. Um, and so I want to look at um, what that portrayal ha was like, and then what is the process for reporting um, for reporters and for administrators and for residents? Um, because residents' voices are often not heard in the public sphere in general, but especially in these news stories. They're, they're you know, writing these news stories about facilities, but not even interviewing residents. Um, and so I would like to understand what factors must be considered for residents, especially to be involved. Um, and so in this study, I'm interviewing long-term care administrators, reporters, and residents. Um, and so I would really be grateful if anyone would be interested in sharing about your experience with COVID and particularly about um, your perceptions of the news and um, and how long-term care or maybe your facility specifically has been reported on. Um, and so I, I'm in the final stretch. I'm trying to get just uh, some more interviews finished and um, each interview would take place over the phone about 30 to 60 minutes or video call would be great too. Um, and all names and identifying information would remain confidential. Um, so those are just the right. the... So uh, th th this is going to be really cool, and I and and I want to have you back on when you're done with this paper to sort of share what you've learned from it. But the um, so folks, if if you work in a senior living, long term care, assisted assisted living would be okay too. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any any senior living sort of setting, um, if you work. But if you, uh, if you know of or can connect, uh, Laura, with any residents that have sort of gone through this. And then uh, lastly, if you've got any friends, family, loved ones who are reporters that might be interested in talking to Laura, I think that this will be fascinating information that can help us in the future from a variety of perspectives. Um, yeah. So Laura, if you want to, um, drop your contact info in the um, in um, chat. As I can see, uh, Katie has already said that they're, um, um, that, that, that the Goodwin House at Home might, members might be interested. So, um, so drop your contact in there. And uh, I really appreciate you, you coming on and really looking forward to, to, uh, hearing the results of this. Also, uh, I, I was chatting with you the other day. You're part of a international collaborative of students, correct? Uh, mm -hmm. That are studying aging worldwide. And um, let's um, try yeah, to- Yeah, that would be great to connect. 
Let's later, try to maybe. get, I think that would be another fascinating discussion is to have you all on to mm -hmm. um, chat about this, uh, a chat about your perceptions on global aging and what's going on around mm -hmm. the world. So Definitely. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks. I'll drop my contact information in the chat. Okay. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay. And with that, uh, let me go back to sharing my screen. And I'm just going to remind everybody, I'm recording this discussion. All of our recordings are on proaging.com. Uh, all of our upcoming events are there. We got a career center, provider search, and you can see, you can order and read the most recent copies of Positive Aging Sourcebook. So that brings us to our topic today. And I'm, I'm super excited. It's uh, to have an author, uh, but not just an author. I think when you get to know Amy, you'll see how um, relevant her background is to a lot of the discussions that we have here on these, uh, these digital discussions. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's ask Amy to come out from behind the curtain and we can uh, get to know you a little bit better. So uh, Amy, first off, congratulations on the new book. Is, is, is this your first book or do you have, uh, do you have a few others on your, on your bookshelf there? No, this is my first book, and honestly, I was I was pushed and nudged and prodded by all my colleagues to get everything in my head in a book to help as many families as I could. I, I love it. So um, before we kind of dive into you know some of the topics that you discuss in in that book and some of the experience that you've had through your lifetime uh, of caring for elders, uh, let's learn a little bit more about you and uh, tell us a little bit about your background and what kind of led you up to the current role that you're you're playing here. Well, first I want to thank Laura for her contribution in the beginning. I love what you're doing and I look forward to hearing more about that, Laura. So thank you for doing all the hard work that you're doing and good luck in getting your degree. Um, so I volunteered in nursing homes when I was in my teenage years and I really loved it. And I felt like a, a freak of nature because all my friends were like, what do you like in that nursing home? And I'd bring girls from the girls club down to the nursing home. So I kind of fell in love with the environment, with the people. They, The residents in the nursing home were honest and open. And even when they were cantankerous, I enjoyed it. I thought it was refreshing. I became an activity director. I went back to school and got a master's in public health administration, a master's in gerontology. I uh, became an administrator in a continuing care retirement community. And I did that for nine years. And I realized that I love working with older people. And that's what I wanted to do. So I had a mentor who worked with me for a few years to start my own business. And I learned about the profession of care management, went around and interviewed all these care managers and decided I could do it. So in 99, I started my own company and we grew uh, I had no idea the phone would ring so fast, so hard for so long. I, I like people were like freaking out over mom. You know, mom's getting discharged from the hospital. Mom needs a rehab facility. Mom's getting Medicare home care. Mom, mom, mom. It was just off the charts. And so we grew into this full service care management company that I sold two years ago. I'm director of care management for a large, um, the largest employer of care managers in the country. But I, my passion is getting information to as many adult children who are struggling with their parents. That's my, my mission uh, in life uh, is to educate, educate. So that, that's my, my 40 years in a, in a, in a minute, I think. <laughs> I love it. And so just uh, number one, like so many of our discussions revolve around the profession of aging life care managers uh, here. The, invaluable pr profession. First off, uh, you're, you're located in Florida, correct? In Orlando, Florida. Orlando. And you sold your practice, which we've had a few practices here in the mid-Atlantic where I'm based being sold over the last few years. Um, the, are you still on with, with your firm under different ownership? Yes. 
I am, I, I, but I've taken on a different role and my role is to uh, help train and develop care managers to do what they need to do to help their clients. So I'm, 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 I'm a support person. That's, that's great. Yeah. Good. That's great. And, uh, and, and congrats number one on uh, building up a, a practice that had value to sell and then also reinvent being able to go on with the, the purchasing entity in a new role. That's, that's no easy feat. And we could probably have a whole discussion on making that transition. But today, the, the, I, I, I love how you framed writing this book because I think um, so many of us in this field you know, have sort of gathered knowledge over the years and probably, you know, when we're chatting with our, our friends, family, loved ones, colleagues, it's sort of statements like you said have sort of come up. You got to put this down. You got to be able to share this with, with folks. And so again, congrats on being able to, on, on the discipline to do that. Um, the, the title of the book is The Fragile Years, Proven Strategies for Care of Aging Loved Ones. Um, Tell us a little bit about the process of putting that book together and sort of, you know, I think when you, when we, when, whenever I put my thoughts down on paper and reflect on them, I always get so much more out of it. Like what are sort of some of the common themes that kind of came out when you were going through that process yourself? That insightful question. So what what I realized was as I wrote the book, uh, I kept hearing this voice in the back of my head and there were the voices of clients I've had that have said, how do people find out about you? How do people learn all this stuff? I had one guy say, I've got a degree in economics and this is like a mystery to me. And, and as I wrote each chapter, I was really amazed. I just took this information for granted. And I was amazed at every topic, you know, hospitals, Medicare, long-term care insurance, and on and on, that there was so much information in each of the systems that any older person would have to interface with. And then I realized, no wonder these kids are freaking out. <laughs> you know, like it's a lot of input. And, when, and I realized that people said, there's so much in your head. There's so much in your head, get it in a book. Now that I have it in a book, I can see there's a lot of information. And you know, when you're trying to take care of your parent and you're tired and stressed and confused, and then you got to make all these decisions really fast. Um, I could see where this book would be helpful because you can open it up to the chapter that you're dealing with and get help right there with maybe it's nursing home, maybe it's assisted living. So um, I think that was the biggest thing I learned is I, I, I underestimated how much was in my head um, that really did need to be in a book. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like when you look back over your career, you look at the current client base that you're, you're um, working with, what are some of the common problems and challenges and um, that, that you see out there in the marketplace for lack of a better term? So when I was in graduate school, I took a course and they said the long-term care system is fragmented. And I, I thought I understood what that meant. And that, that is a theme that's carried on to now. It's fragmented. So all the systems that help older adults, whether it's healthcare or financial, they're siloed. We don't have, it's not a comprehensive, easy to follow. You have, you're in one system, you gotta learn that system. You're in the hospital, you gotta learn the hospital. You're in the rehab center, you gotta learn the rehab center. You're, you're getting Medicaid, you need to understand Medicaid. This Medicare and Medicaid talk to each other. And it, that it is still fractured, um, which makes it challenging moving from one system to the other. Um, yeah. No, no, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And it seems like that's a common theme that's that um, that we've been talking about as well is, is that um, 
And so, you know, given that we've got this fractured system, obviously the solution that I always sort of throw out to folks is, well, you need to hire a care manager or a patient advocate or whatever. But, um, but for those folks that are out there, any words of wisdom in tr sort of what do you do when you encounter this, this fractured system? So the first piece of advice I would give is <clears throat> because every system's in a hurry, slow your decision making down. You know, take 24 hours, take 48 hours, all the urgency that you might feel with that hospital discharge planner on the phone trying to push your mom out of the hospital, just slow it down. Say, I'm gonna wait and sleep on the decision. So I would say that, um, you know, care management in some parts of the world might be perceived as being expensive. I'd invest in at least a few hours of a care manager's time to get the roadmap, just to get the roadmap to help guide you for the future. Um, I would also say that start the conversations with your parents as early as they are willing to start them. You know, you can't make your parents talk to you, um, but you can listen really carefully. And when they provide an opening, and there, there, are, there are openings, you know, a friend of theirs might have knee surgery and they might be, you know, wanting to visit them in the hospital or maybe they lost a friend at church or, so you can start asking open-ended questions to learn uh, what's important to them so that when something does happen, you know how to support them. I, I love it. Yeah, and not easy. And it's just it's sort of communicating with your parents. For those of us who have kids, there's, uh, or teenagers especially, um, there's a lot of uh, similarities there. The, um, I, you know, I always, when I have an author on, I always sort of like to kind of reflect on the title of your book and you, you call this the fragile years. Um, what, what, tell me a little bit about th that because I, I see it is a common theme throughout the whole, um, the whole book. Yeah, well, I had a lot of adult children say to me in the first few years that I started in the field say, I just wasn't expecting this. I just wasn't expecting this. And I, I thought in the first time I was said, I was like, well, what, what were you thinking? Like, <laughs> you know, it, it was obvious to me. And then I realized over time that a lot of kids, cause there's not a lot of talk about growing older and we're a youth-based culture and it, it, that people think their parents are gonna live and then they're gonna die. They don't, they don't realize that most of the time, not always, most of the time, there's a five year period of time where they are fragile. And that's defined by they're moving more slowly. They're, they're, they're processing more slow, they're slower. They might be using a walker. They're, they're, they're in a stage that's a defined stage that the adult children didn't realize it. And I, I've heard the word frail or frailty and that feels negative to me. Mm -hmm. I think the word fragile kind of captures, you know, the fragility of that time. And then the aggressiveness of all the systems going up against that fragile person, you have to protect them from outside systems that they might be fragile, but, and their care needs to be less rather than more. Yeah. And then I so teaching the stages of being fragile and then managing the healthcare system around that fragility. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. And, you know, the language that we use when talking about these topics, it's, it's such a, uh, a difficult process. Okay. You know, I mean, don't call me a senior. I like elder. Don't say elderly, you know, this, that, and the other. I, I like your rationale there with the fragile years because something that's fragile is valuable. You know, our elders are valuable. And, and I also like the analogy of, you know, all these conflicting systems that are, are pushing up against something that's valuable and it can, um, it, it could break. And um, that's, uh, I, I think that's, that's really good. Um, the, um, now, Whenever I 
talk with the care manager. It's, I always sort of like to bring up the topic of aging in place versus making a move. Um, and I know that you sort of touch on this in your book. Um, any thoughts that you can share with folks out there that, that might be sort of caught between this, whether it be themselves or for their loved ones and, and uh, words of wisdom? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a very practical person and I like to know what somebody can afford before I start talking about which system, like which direction they should go in. Sometimes the money drives the decision and it's unfortunate and it's sad. You don't have a lot of money. Assisted living or facilities is the place to go because 24 hour care, home care can get expensive quickly. So that's, you know, job one is see, you know, how much money is there? How old is the person? And will they run out of money before they die? Because who wants to do that? Okay. Then the other is 80% of older adults want to stay at home. They don't want to move to a community. Okay. Now, when someone loses their memory, uh, a valuable observation I've seen over the years is they may have verbalized that they want to stay home, but sometimes someone with a bad memory needs stimuli and the programmatic benefits of being in a community. Sometimes someone that is very extroverted needs to be in a community because it's easier to interface and shuck and jive with all the people at the resident. Um, sometimes, uh, well, I'll throw this out. When someone is ready to leave the world, like not imminent, someone's ready to like their, their last year of life. It is very, very normal to want to disengage from the outside world. And if they're at home and they've said, I wanna stay at home and they're not interested in getting out and going out and seeing people and doing things, that's kind of normal. Then you might wanna you know, provide a way for them to stay at home because it's gonna be easier for them to leave the world without all the outside stimuli uh, disturbing their, the natural process of dying. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's uh, well, well said there. Um, the, um, one of the chapters in your book deals with uh, pharmacy um, and, 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 the, uh, and, and I like how you frame it, Pharmageddon. The, uh, what, uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit about that and what are some things that folks can be thinking about in that area? Well, you know, the fragile person, you know, has a symptom and one doctor throws a piece of medicine at it, you know, throws a pill at it. And that specialist might not be talking to the other specialist who throws another medicine. So it's not really abnormal for a care manager to get a client that's on 16, 17, 18, 20, 37 medications. And so, and I'm not a pill pusher. So, you know, full disclaimer, I'm, I'm really opposed to medication unless it's absolutely necessary. On top of that, uh, with a memory impaired person, they might be behaviorally challenged. And if you're in a nursing home, you run the risk of being put on an antipsychotic um, and another, like lots of medications just to manage your behavior when it really might be more helpful to have some more natural uh, ways to manage that behavior, um, caregiver approaches. Um, and that's probably a whole discussion in and of itself. So we often partner with senior pharmacists or geriatric psychopharmacologists to help us determine, and I'll, I'll use an example. I had a, a client with a lot of leg pain and he was memory challenged and his wife kept wanting him to push him around, push her around the assisted living facility. And we ended up with a pharmacist, geriatric psychopharmacologist found that he was on a statin that was causing him leg pain. We took him off the statin, the leg pain decreased his behavior got a little better. That's very simplistic, but it gets the point across that never underestimate the power of having 
your medications evaluated and streamlined as you enter the fragile years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, it definitely, um, the communication between physicians and prescriptions is, um, you know, one of these super challenging things. And I always, I, you know, what I'm always, when, when I get calls from folks and they say, I think my, my dad may have dementia or cognitive decline. Uh, one of the first things that I always will say is it's like, well, make sure that you, you have him, you know, talk to a neurologist. Uh, but just out of curiosity, do you know how many prescriptions he's taking? And, uh, you know, what's, what's been interesting, the last few people that I've talked to, there's like, my mom and dad are not taking anything. I was like, oh boy, you know, I almost was sort of like, oh, I wish you said that they were taking five or six medications because probably just adjusting that could fix the problem or, or it may fix the problem. So um, yeah, really, really uh, interesting topic there. The, um, um, and the, uh, the, the other thing that I know that you touch on briefly in, in the book is on hospital readmissions. And this is something that comes up with a lot of our, the providers who are in the audience. Um, any kind of thoughts on that one? Well, another full disclosure. Um, I, a lot of our work is preventing hospitalization. Whoops. Oh boy. Let's see. A uh, little technical glitch there, Amy. I, you just froze up. So while we're way, what, and, and, is. There you go. Okay, you just kind of buffered on us there. So um, if you don't mind repeating what you just said about when I asked you about hospital readmissions. The, the son that hired me to help him with his mother was bragging to me about his devotion as a son and the fact that he had taken his mother, accompanied his mother to the hospital nine times in the last oh. year. Okay, yeah, that's uh, the, the son's time can be spent doing something else. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, eight times too many. Mm -hmm. Probably. So when when an older person's in the fragile years, and they're in the hospital, and the hospital's wanting to run tests, we are coaching our clients to say, if the result of the test is a procedure that I don't want, don't do the test. You know, a swallow study. If, there, if I fail the swallow study and I don't want a feeding tube, don't do the swallow study. I'm being very simplistic, but my point yeah. with hospitalizations is that hospital systems, it's a capitalized system. The more they do, the more money they make. Mm -hmm. And with a person in the fragile years, the less you do, the higher quality of life they're going to have. And I'm, I'm saying things that might, might be a lightning rod kind of thing on this podcast. But my, my point is that you can say no to tests in the hospital. And if I've heard it once, I've heard it 20,000 times. My father was never the same after the surgery. My mm -hmm. father should never have had that pacemaker put in. My father should never have had that valve replaced because mm -hmm. they were never the same again. And so I like to tell people to have professional courage when you're in the system and ask these good questions. And it's okay to say no. It really is okay to say no. And sometimes the physicians are relieved when you say no because they're conflicted while they're there on a 98 year old that they're wanting to put a pacemaker in and he's severely demented. So I use these examples just to drive the point home that that really what our what our healthcare system lacks is that that middle place that's just make me comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, open up a wing in the nursing home for not hospice care because I'm not really dying, but I just want less interruption. Mm -hmm. You know, 
you, 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 let me stop eating, you know, in a nursing home. Why is it, why do you, why are you giving me insure when I've just lost my appetite and losing my appetite is kind of a natural thing when I'm dying? Yeah. No, these are all co very common sense things. And uh, yet the uh, maternity wings on all of our hospitals are just becoming these huge behemoths with all the accoutrements that you would ever, it's like you said, I like how you, you framed a hospital as a capitalized system. And if you see where the money is invested, you can, um, it, it, it's an unfortunate that it's not focused many times on our elders and um, creating as supportive an environment as we can there. So um, I also really like your advice on having the courage to say no. I think, unfortunately, what happens is we're left alone so long in the hospital where nobody is answering our questions. Once you get that like two to three minute conversation with the doctor, it's just sort of like, okay, I wanna be doing something instead of nothing. So everybody says yes to everything that the guy in the white or, or the, the individual in the white coat uh, says to us. Um, the, these are some great, great feedback and, and congratulations on the book. I, I wanna just, I always sort of say this, that in these discussions where you're so thorough and we've talked about so many different topics, a lot of times anybody in the audience is sort of like, well, they answered all my questions. I, I want to sort of, as we wind things down here, remind the audience that if you've got any sort of last minute questions, comments on any of the topics that we've just talked about, throw them in there or uh, raise your virtual hand. And, and with that, uh, uh, Amy, if you want, if, if there's anything that you'd like to share that you, that you haven't sort of uh, shared, uh, you can uh, you can uh, jump in here. I think what I what I would want for anybody that was helping their parents, I would want them to have support. Um, I would want them to have a friend that they can vent to and say all the things that they're embarrassed about. All the I wish mom would go ahead and die, and why am I even thinking that? And I don't, you know the anger that they might feel at dad having called about the remote control 20 times when she's told them. And um, I would want them to have someone that knew healthcare, whether it's somebody at a doctor's office, whether it's a care manager, whether it's someone that can be an ear and help them with their parents in making those decisions. I would want them to have um, knowledge of the, the finances, of their parents, you know, get as much information ahead of time as possible so they're ready. Um, there's lots of online support there, but the value of having a team, whether that's two people or four people or whatever it is, have that support because it's a long hike. It's kind of like when your child is a teenager, you know, those are a long three to five years. <laughs> And it's the same with a parent. You got to really pace yourself emotionally because it's it's a it's a lifestyle change. You're whether they're across the country or whether they're in town, your your lifestyle has changed. And and probably lastly, I would say, especially if they're local and you've taken on the job of being the the caregiver, is don't be afraid to drop off commitments that are work for you to take on some act activities that might just be replanning for you. Maybe you get off of a board and you join a yoga class because emotionally you need to keep yourself tanked up a little bit or filled up a little bit so that you're not so, you know, when you run on empty, you're more irritated, you don't get enough sleep, you kind of run down and then you emotionally say things that you regret later and I find this time of life to be beautiful, truthfully. You, you have to move slower, and I think that's valuable on a lot of levels. You have to, your communications are slower and more meaningful, the, the stimuli is brought down, and that can be um, a spiritual time for you if you turn off the rest of the noise 
that's in your life that might might be detracting from the opportunity you have at hand to really be with your parents. I I, I love well, very well said. I think that it's um, um, this is such a confusing as you had illustrated. This is such a confusing time, and most of us are thrown into it um, unexpected. Um, and the um, I, I really like what you said about you know having somebody to vent with, somebody that it, you can just complain and you don't have to worry about your your language or offending someone, but you can just get the way you're feeling off your chest so that you're not taking that out on a loved one or what have you. The, the other thing is you were talking that I've reflected on is, is that a lot of times when people are going through this journey of helping their loved one in the fragile years, they become a better elder themselves because they understand the challenges that a family goes through and then they begin to take steps not to um, follow in their, their parents' footsteps. That's a really wise thing you just said. I've seen a lot of children helping their parents and their children are watching them. And I've heard this, been, this has been said, I, I never wanna do this to my children. And you, you become uh, more of a planner and more open in your own wishes and desires. So you really never stop teaching your children and they're watching you take care of their parents. So um, that's very, I'm glad you said that, Steve. Yeah. Um, somebody asks, are, are you still available to be hired as an aging life care manager for families that may need help? I am. I okay. am. Great, and and uh, I I put um, Amy's email address in in that question. I also dropped it in the um, the chat, and I also put the Amazon link to her book. Um, so feel free to reach out to, to her. And um, you're you're based in Florida, but um, the beauty of this world now is. People can can get guidance from care managers all over the the country, um, and as we know, a lot of us have loved ones that are down there in Florida. So you can be a great resource for um, for for folks. So um, let's see. Um, oh, and and another question is, Amy, do you provide any training for new aging life care managers? Oh my goodness, I have not been asked that in a while, but I'm going to say yes. Great. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. And the Aging Life Care Association also, if you don't already know, this has wonderful training and their conferences provide really great access to information as well. But yeah, I can help. I can help new care managers. Of course, you know, even when you've been in the field a long time, you always learn new things. It's a, it's a really, it's a wonderful well, profession. Yeah, one of the cool things that we've been doing here over the last few months is we've been doing panel discussions with aging life care managers, with elder law attorneys, with move managers. You get two or three different practices and they're on and they're having a discussion. And so many times, like one care manager will say to the other, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> and um, it's, uh, it's, it's great that there's such a collaborative uh, profession out there. And uh, yeah. we're all learning from each other. That's um, exactly right. So, all right. Well, this has been great. I, I thank you for your time today. And it um, uh, looks like we got through the, the questions and comments. I, I hope everybody goes out and reaches out to Amy. Look into the, uh, the book. Oh, this is what always happens. I start babbling. It's like, can you talk about dementia and spoon feeding? and COVID healthcare proxy to express your wishes. Wow, that's a, uh, a few topics in one. So, so any thoughts on somebody that might be caring with somebody with dementia who needs assistance with spoon, spoon feeding? So I'll be very, very careful when I say this. Um, you have to intuit your way through feeding them. So I believe that 
even with dementia, people are and have control over when they die. Um, everybody has an inner will to live and they are in control of that uh, will to die. So if you are feeding someone, spoon feeding someone with dementia and they keep shutting their mouth, they're indicating to you non-verbally that they do not want to eat. So I would say that um, if it's an issue with whether you should find another way to feed them, my instinct would be to say no, that they're, they're communicating non-verbally that they're ready to go. If the issue is um, a, a, an issue in a community, should the nursing home feed someone with dementia, spoon feed someone with dementia, they are obligated by regulation to do so. If, if a person can't eat, they are required to help them eat. So if that's a problem that someone's wanting to fix, it would be to meet with the unit nurse in that facility and have a conversation over um, how and what time it's best for them to get the one-on-one -on -one feeding that is needed. And sometimes getting fed, if you change the time to be uh, not during the rush of meal time, it's a little bit, that might be an option. It's like getting your bath on the three to 11 shift as opposed to seven to three. There, the staff to patient ratio on that shift is usually better um, and people are in bed. So you might get more attention from the aide giving you a bath on that, um, on that at that time. That I hope I answered that question. Actually, they typed in and said, thank you. This is so complicated, but important. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks for, for giving us some insight on that. As the uh, attendee said, it's very complicated. So, okay. So now I'm I, now we're gonna really wind this up. I, I really thanks, thank you for your time. Thanks everybody for attending. We'll make sure to get this recording out and uh, as well as a link to Amy's book and definitely stay in touch and uh, um, really excited about everything that you've got going on, a really interesting career you've put together. Well, and thank you for doing what you do, Steve. This is a great resource for people. Thank you so much for being there. You bet. Okay. Talk to everybody soon.